What is it about AI that makes it difficult for game development? You hear all these stories in the news about AI learning to play StarCraft, Dota 2, Overcooked, Doom, Street Fighter, Rocket League and more. But yet when you boot up the latest and greatest on your chosen platform, non-player characters and other opponents don't seem to be anywhere near as smart. So what gives? I'm Tommy Thompson and welcome to AI 101 here on AI and Games. And in this video we're going to unpack this question. What is it about games that makes it difficult for AI? Despite having made over a hundred videos on the subject of AI for video games, this is an issue I've never succinctly described. But it's increasingly one that needs to be addressed. If a team of researchers can train an AI to play your favourite AAA title, while the built-in AI for regular play is nowhere near as complex, what gives? It's understandably a question people will ask. For this video, I am focusing solely on the challenge of a games programmer trying to make compelling AI, rather than the challenge of a researcher or hobbyist trying to train an AI to play a game. These are two distinctly different problems, and I can dedicate a separate video to the latter of the two, if you wish. With that in mind, it's important to distinguish between these two things. An AI that learns to play a game operates in a very different capacity from one that is programmed to be part of a game you're playing. If we consider, for example, StarCraft II, where Google DeepMind trained the AlphaStar bot to become a grandmaster, this is a machine learning AI that is trained outside of the game itself. It spends weeks learning to become the very best player, costing millions of dollars to produce, and relying on data recorded of top-tier humans that it learned from. Once trained, it can make decisions very quickly, given it already knows how to respond to those scenarios being presented to it. In addition, it isn't part of the game itself. It's an external program making decisions that then pass in input actions to the game, much like a human player would. Meanwhile, the AI built into the game is created by a team of programmers and designers during the development process. It has to accommodate for varying skill levels, address the needs of designers who want the AI to operate in a specific way, and also is at the mercy of the game's resources. AI has to operate alongside core game logic, rendering, input management, online connectivity, and much more besides. Plus, as we've seen throughout the dozens of episodes I've made over the years, the types of AI techniques used in games are more often than not quite different from those you're seeing in the news. The likes of AlphaStar and the OpenAI 5 are machine learning systems that are trained on vast server farms, and generative AI tools like DALI and GPT still need to run on those servers after training, given their size and complexity. Whereas non-player characters and enemy AI in games typically use what is known as symbolic AI, but the system looks at all the possible configurations of the world and determines which configuration it should reach by searching for a path towards it, and it does so at runtime on your PC, console, or even mobile device. There are exceptions to this, of course, but there are also reasons for why this is often adopted in a video game, which we'll unpack later. Now, to really get into the meat of the topic, we're going to discuss some core AI principles that should get those brain juices pumping. For those of you without a background in computer science or AI, we're going to talk some theoretical fundamentals, basic terminology that anyone who has studied the field will be familiar with, and it's how we can begin to define the challenges presented by different games from the perspective of a developer. Perhaps the most critical element to understand is the notion of a state, a snapshot of a problem which the AI is trying to solve. In a game, this can range from the position of relevant items and strategy games between turns to the position and activities of all enemies in the current frame of a first-person shooter. It's important to only capture the relevant information of the current state, rather than fill it up with unnecessary info. Given every possible unique value that can exist will influence the number of unique states that can occur. Knowing how many pixels are rendered in the health UI is far less useful than simply knowing how much health the player has as a number. Based on the current state, an AI can then make an action. The idea being that the action will change the state in some way. The easiest way to understand this is the movement of a piece in a board game. The action taken is one that is permissible by the game's state, and in doing so it often, but not always, will lead to a new state. This is known as a state transition system or function. The idea that actions will change the world provided we pick good ones in key moments. Understanding the number of possible states, the number of actions and how they interlink is a big issue for any AI problem, be it for in-game behaviour or for training bots. This web of states connected by actions is known as a state space. 
A symbolic AI system needs to be able to search the state space for good collections of actions to execute in sequence, while a machine learning system needs to learn what actions make the most sense in a given state, often by measuring the value of an action either in its immediate future, because you killed an enemy, or 10 minutes from now, given you put enough good actions together to win the game. But the relationship between states and actions can become increasingly fraught, and make it difficult for a game developer or researcher to approach the problem. For one, the sheer amount of states can be an issue. A small and simple puzzle game may only have hundreds or thousands of unique states, but for many a contemporary video game, when you consider the number of unique situations that can exist, it quickly moves into the millions, if not billions. In fact, as discussed in a previous episode, it's estimated that StarCraft has 2 times 10 to the power of 1,685 unique states. That's a 2 with 1,685 zeros after it. But to make matters worse is notions of determinism and observability. Determinism is essentially whether there is any random chance at play in the game. This can mean we can't guarantee, based on a given state, whether an action will execute as intended or can predict the behaviour of AI characters. It's what made Ms. Pac-Man a much more complex game for players when compared to the 1980 original, given now the ghosts can opt to move randomly. And way back in the early days of AI in games, I discussed why this led to an entire body of AI research back in the early 2000s. Plus, all of this relies on the idea that we know for sure the current state of the game. If you consider a strategy game or a card game, you typically don't know the entire state, only what is directly in front of you, so the system has to make a judgement based on limited knowledge, or guess what state it's currently in, which can be equally problematic, given many different states can look very similar on first passing. Now, this is but the tip of the iceberg for a myriad of technical aspects of AI, but from here we have enough of a grasp to begin to understand why, as a video game developer, building AI can prove a challenge. It's important to state that, from the top, the resulting system that makes decisions needs to be fast, and depending on the genre, that speed can often be in but mere milliseconds. An enemy in a first-person shooter needs to come up with an action that makes sense now, not spend three seconds thinking about it. Otherwise, by the time it comes up with a super-intelligent solution to the problem, the situation has changed so drastically, the solution is largely useless. Plus, if it did spend three seconds thinking about it, it would probably cause the game's performance to stutter. While we're long past the days of the PS3 and Xbox 360, where games like Spec Ops The Line had strict limits of only 8 active AI at once, the performance budgets for AI characters haven't improved drastically in the years since, largely because of all the flashy graphics, but that's an issue for another time. To maintain good performance, in games it's common for both the problem space to be rapidly reduced, but the mechanisms to come up with solutions become much more truncated. Systems like finite state machines and behaviour trees, which we've covered in previous episodes, solve this problem in two distinct ways. First, they ensure that logic for possible actions is tighter and more explicit. It reduces the process of finding and selecting the correct action to a series of conditions that will guarantee their execution. This is useful for a game designer, given you know why an AI is going to behave in the way that it does, and can account for a variety of circumstances but that in turn robs the AI of more intelligent or interesting decisions it could possibly make. Alternative solutions, such as planning systems like in Fear, help to resolve this. Goal-oriented action planning uses a description language to allow the AI to search for good combinations of actions to create plans of attack, but even then, this is tightly constrained, with most plans in Fear only being a handful of actions in length, and even then, it has to reassess whether that plan is valid as it executes it given the plan to jump through a window might no longer make sense because the player is now standing in the way. Plus, we haven't factored in things like what information about the state of the game each AI should know, what goals should they have, whether those goals change, where in the game world can they move, how do you differentiate between valid options. This latter point is a concept I explored in my AI 101 episode on Utility AI, which often helps solve this problem. All of this highlights the problems that exist for creating non-player characters in games, if the optimal decision was made for every character, would make games less performant and often result in sluggish behaviour, which is not ideal for what is meant to be an interactive medium. While many of the games mentioned thus far in this video are older and subject to stricter system limitations, these problems still persist today. Games are increasingly more complex environments as the technology continues to make significant gains, and that makes it all that much harder to maintain the illusion of intelligence across the entirety of a gameplay experience. 
This is why we often see concessions being made. AI that cheats and has access to knowledge it shouldn't in the likes of a strategy or horror game makes sense because it allows for it to make decisions that fit the spirit of the game more effectively than trying to operate without it. AI characters that fake collaboration in the heat of the moment is more practical than trying to get two separate AI systems to work together to figure out a good strategy. Or even trying to anticipate the player's actions can be a nightmare given players are unreliable and prone to changing up playstyles or approaches as situations unfold so we may cheat and read information directly from the player to help us out. In each of these cases, it's more important to ensure the experience is fun, rather than the AI be exceedingly intelligent. Because at the end of the day, players don't want something that is as intelligent as it could be, because AI in a game that operates at the peak of its faculties isn't fun to play against for 99.9% .9 of the audience. You want something interesting and fallible, and that's a challenge in and of itself. Now, you might have listened to all this and then thought, well, that's because we're still using older AI techniques, state machines, utility functions, planning algorithms. I already mentioned the use of machine learning and deep learning. Why isn't that just used all of the time? With machine learning, it's really a chicken and egg problem. You need the game to be ready in order for the ML system to learn how to play within the rules you've set. The machine learning algorithm will then create the final trained system, often referred to as a policy which will know what to do for each state in the game it encounters. But if the game is changed, then it could have an impact on the quality of the policy. And so you need to train it again. This doesn't really work for a game that is in development, given you're often fixing bugs, making adjustments, or finalizing and adding content at various stages of the development timeline. Any one of these can lead to the policy having to be retrained. This is what makes big success stories like Alpha Star and the OpenAI 5 very misleading given those systems were trained years after the game came out, based on a large amount of existing replay data that can only be generated by an online community playing the game regularly after launch. But even then, it suffers from the same limitations, given you'll have noticed that neither of these systems have ever reappeared in their respective games. The reason for that? The games get patched with balance changes, and more often than not in games such as StarCraft and Dota, it means that the trained policies drop in quality significantly, as a result of changes to the meta, only it's much harder and more expensive for them to readjust to those changes compared to a regular player. This isn't to say it's impossible to use ML for enemy AI, but you'll notice from many of the examples I've listed over the years on AI in games, such as Forza and Gran Turismo, they tend to be in complex but tightly defined problem spaces. In fact, racing games are a fantastic place to experiment with them. However, as discussed in a previous episode of AI 101, we tend to find more use for machine learning in other areas of game development. For more on that, be sure to check out that video. This episode of AI 101 has been about highlighting why AI is a real challenge in the context of game development. Naturally, I can't cover the whole subject in one readily accessible YouTube video, but hopefully you get the idea. And of course, to all you game devs out there, get in the comments and share the problems you've experienced over the years. I'm sure that will be enlightening for many who have never tried this out themselves. Meanwhile, in some future episodes of AI 101, I will dig deeper into specific genres, explore why they're difficult to build AI for them, as well as common approaches that are taken by developers to make AI for them. Plus, I'll also unpack the challenges for researchers in training AI to play games as well. Be sure to leave a comment on what genres you would like to see me tackle in a future video. On that note, I want to thank our production team on the AI and Games Patreon who suggested this topic. The production team are my top crowdfunding supporters, and every month we have meetings where I talk about everything in the pipeline, but also get critical feedback and suggestions from the team that we then discuss in more detail. It was the production team's idea not only for this episode, but also for the future videos digging into specific genres and together we've ironed out into what you're seeing now. To have your say in how AI and games moves forward and participate in our production meetings, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash AI and games. And with that, that's us for this episode of AI 101. As always, thanks for watching and I hope you learned something new and enjoyed your time along the way. Stay safe, have fun, and I'll be back. Yeah.